Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Lee Bardugo. I'm the author of the Grisha trilogy, Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Ruin and Rising that just came out in June. Nice. Nice. Um, <laughs> I'm Sandy Jones. I'm the author of the Throne of Glass series, um, Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, Assassin's Blade, and Air of Fire, which is coming out in like two weeks in America, and a couple weeks after that. Okay, so I know that in a lot of interviews you get asked like, who is your favourite character? And it, I guess it's quite hard for authors to pick one, and normally you see maybe the main character. So I guess, who is your favourite character in each of these series? Um, Nahemia is my favourite character from Sarah's series. I was going to say Mel. Mm, you're so hot. <laughs> <laughs> so hot. Oh my god. Oh, my, my, ex, my body temperature actually just went up. <laughs> Sorry camera, I'm like, my pits just got really steep. <laughs> okay. Privateer as Sturmhand, like I would be a privateer, <laughs> but otherwise I'd be a heart render and be like, I don't like you, I'm gonna put you to sleep. Like, oh my goodness. That was like slightly that. terrifying with like the rings in your nails. I could like see that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So on the other side, would you rather be human, fear, witch, human with magic, or an witch? I want the iron teeth and yeah. the nails, and I want to be able to, I don't <laughs> want to be able to rip out <laughs> someone's throat with my teeth. But the ability. But with somebody else's team, that. that would be great. Um, I'm going to pick Faye. Mm. Yeah. They're really attractive. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, music. Uh, how important and influential is the music? Um, music? I mean, music literally inspired this entire series for me. Um, so, and music still inspires every scene, every character, every moment, um, especially like movie scores, classical yeah. music. The music, I have to have music on or else like the silence, like, swallows me whole. Kind of different playlists depending on what kind of mood your character is in, on different characters. Yeah, I mean, like, I keep, like, really extensive detailed playlists for all of my books that, like, it's like outlining with a playlist where, like, basically I have all the music in the order of the scenes that have inspired in the book, and so if the scene gets moved or cut, I'll, like, take that, like, song out move it in the playlist, um, so it kind of helps me when I'm revising to be able to kind of slip into a scene or a mood, because I know I can look at those songs and play them and get into my character's heads. Yeah, I never used to listen to music um, when I was writing, and that really changed when I got into book two, especially. Like, when I wrote book one, for whatever reason, I would never write to music, and now I really use it to get into the right frame of mind. Um, the kind of cool thing is that um, I've had... Uh, some people make fan mixes and playlists on Tumblr and so mm -hmm. forth. So I'll go in and I'll just, um, if I don't know the songs, I'll go in and mine them and like take a whole bunch oh, of really? them. Yeah. And then I like recently I was driving up the coast to go to a writing retreat and I was listening to all of them and this one song by Alpha Rev came on that I had never heard of and never even heard of them and I was like, <gasps> oh my gosh. And I listened to that when I was writing the Dark Blooms prequel story. Like I just listened to it on repeat the entire time. Oh, wow. So I've actually found a lot of music through readers, which is kind of cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. So how, when did Winter Fred come around? Oh when gosh! Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I'm glad. That's okay. so nice. Um, oh, honestly, I was when I was writing Shadow and Bone, and I was driving around in the car, and I had this, there's this um, uh, folk melody that my band actually used to play, and I sort of had it in my head, and I started just, I was stuck in traffic or whatever, and um, started coming up with words for it, and I actually wrote, I put my cell phone on, you know, like, voice memo or whatever, and recorded myself singing the first two verses, and they stayed exactly the same, and I just wrote a third verse, and I am lucky enough to have a lot of, like, um, guys from my band, guys who used to be in the bands, and um, they all just did a lot of favors, and we put two, <laughs> that whole thing, like, that whole song was written, um, was um, recorded in my friend's living room. And it sounds like there's a choir, but that's like his wife and her friend 
Um, oh, yeah, wow. they're actually singing words from the book, and like um, everybody was like, it was all recorded in his living room, and it just is just very talented, nice people doing their favors, basically. It's <laughs> yeah. a really special so thing cool. to have, though, like all those people that like it love you. Really, like, it was, it felt really, really great, and it was a cool way to like get to see them because yeah. you get so busy when you're working, and it was a good excuse to get them together and do something. Okay, so let them go off. Um, Lee, you've finished one series now, yeah. and Harry, you're starting another one. Well, you've mm -hmm. already finished. Um, so, since we've had where inspiration for your first one came from, about like Cinderella and the fairy tales, and going down the dark corridor, but, so where did you, what kind of inspiration inspired these new books? Same kind of fairy tales? Mm -hmm. or? Well, mm -hmm. I've still got the other three from the last books to write, but then this new series that I'm writing, um, A Court of Thorns and Roses, the first one's out. I think it's coming May, May 2015, and that one, um, big surprise, was inspired by music, um, by actually listening to the uh, the Princess Mononoke soundtrack. Um, yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorite movies ever. Um, yeah, like bloody <laughs> warrior, yeah. um, <laughs> like speaks to my soul. Um, and then it kind of became this thing that was inspired by Beauty and the Beast, and um, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, and the Legend of Tamlin. Um, I love fairy tale retellings and like mashups. Um, and it's actually wound up like going away from those things. It started off as a retelling of those, and now it's kind of more original fantasy. Um, well, yeah. Throne of Glass too, right? Yeah, Throne of Glass was Cinderella, in one place um, and, yeah. and now it's where its own thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, music, big surprise. Um, I really love like ragtag band of misfit stories, like. Um, Ocean's Eleven and The Dirty Dozen and Inglorious Bastards, and I wanted to write a, I wanted to write basically a heist story. Um, so that's where the inspiration for the dregs came from, and it is exactly that. It's this um, group of outcasts and misfits who are from like the lowest of the low, this gang um, in this slum called The Barrel, and um, they basically are tasked with um, a kind of impossible heist that is essentially a suicide mission. And, I mean, if you read Ruin and Rising, like you can tell, I like like <laughs> like friends who are facing impossible odds. So that's basically <laughs> what I was going for with this. And I also wanted to write kind of a cast of like semi-despicable characters. So that was kind of fun to do. Yeah, like the goo like fantasy Goonies. Yeah, but like they're With, like, much more thuggish than the Goonies. <laughs> 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 like, like I don't think the Goonies are like gonna pluck somebody's eye out. Oh wait, does that happen? No, the, I mean the Fratellis <laughs> and the Goonies are yeah. pretty like. If you took the Fratellis, made them a lot more attractive, and like <laughs> instilled the zaniness yeah. of the Goonies. <laughs> I love that. Okay, this is the book of my soul. <laughs> okay, so how important is it to have flawed characters? Like the main character to be not perfect. Like it makes it fun and exciting, and makes the writing unpredictable. And I think it gives readers something to relate to, also, because we're none of us are perfect. Yeah, I don't um, know about you, but. <laughs> You are a flawless human being. It's <laughs> true. Um, you know, this is, it's funny because I've seen criticism levels at Sarah's work and at my work um, that could actually be like mirror images of each other. Like, oh, Selena's so vain, she's so cocky. And then like, Alina's so insecure, she's so whiny. You know, and there's this, every time you see somebody saying that if like a heroine is too this or too that, those are the things that make a character. Mm -hmm. And they're the things that guys get away with all of the time. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. I think our heroines would be pretty boring they didn't have an edge Yeah. Um, so when people say that, you know, they hate the evil characters and things, do you kind of sit back and think that they're a little part of me, they came from me, and do you kind of have a little secret smile for yourself? And you just said you want to be yeah. a witch. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, like, it sounds really disturbing to, like, you know, say that you connect with some of these characters that do really horrible things, but I think, like, good villains, what was that quote? Like, like good villains see themselves as the heroes and um, and I think like when, in order to write a good villain, you need to think of them as a person with their motivations and backgrounds. I mean, like the Darkling, like he's got like hordes of fans that are obsessed with him. And, like I, I, I thought he was hot, but he's like a really atrocious, he's a monster. Yeah. And, but like you made him like, like he's sexy and approachable and like there's something about him that readers connected with. And Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, like you said, I think if you're not able to, you should always be able to make your villain's case. You know, you should always be able, if otherwise, uh, why would people follow them? 
you know, the people who enter our lives and who are the most dangerous are not people who come in, you know, twirling a mustache. I mean, they go, oh, <laughs> do evil deeds. They're people who are charismatic and charming yeah. and appealing and, um, and, and who speak to some part of us that makes us want to follow, that makes us, you know, attracted to them. So mm -hmm. it was important to me that my heroes not be all good and that my villains not be all bad. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, Sarah writes actual POV chapters from her villains, so that's... It's, you're really in their heads. Yeah, yeah. well, that's like the, the witch narrative and yeah. Air of Fire. That was a, she, Manon is a villain. She's a bad guy. Yeah. gonna face off against the good guys. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I just like adding her voice to the story, I think, like, it did something. Like, I was something that I connected with and I wanted to add to kind of broaden the world and also offer a different glimpse of, like, the two sides of what's happening in this conflict. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that uh, it's, it's important just to have you explore the main characters, but to also have relatable evil characters yeah. within because the Darkling is probably the most liked kind of character or noble character in Manon. You kind of you like her even though she's doing nasty things. Yeah. Right. That's well, what makes it exciting though, yeah. I think, you know. And I think too, that if we're gonna let if we're gonna make it tough on our heroes and make them flawed, then we have to sort of see the whole perspective. That said, like I think we both actually, we both have two kings in our stories that are yeah. pretty much universally despicable, Yeah, you know? So every so often, you'll just sort of use a shorthand for like, but he's really, really bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I, I think sometimes people want to be let off the hook a little bit and say, well, is this person bad or is this person good? You know, like, am I supposed to like Selena or am I Selena? Yeah. Selena. <laughs> Um, I was also waiting for you to pronounce Manal, so oh. it was like, um, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's not one or the other. You're supposed to just be in the story and make your own choices. Um, so what is your opinion on the whole kind of thing that adults shouldn't read really why? <laughs> I mean, people have like too many opinions on things like that. It's like, it's a, everybody it's shut up. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, just, I mean, no, like good books, like, you know. People are reading. I'm, I'm happy if people are reading yeah. anything. I don't care what the hell they're reading. Yeah. I just am happy that anyone is picking up a book and investing in it and getting behind it. That's I think that's the thing too is uh, agreed. And I think the thing to be aware of is um, these articles crop up every couple of months, right? Yeah. And I think it's a really good thing to watch out for because you don't see those articles crop up about the things that men and boys buy in bulk that maybe are not the most edifying or that are not, you know, that they, you know they're not books that are going to cure cancer, but they're, uh, they don't receive the same amount of criticism um, as young adults or romance. And the reason is because people get winged out when ladies are really into things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, anytime somebody tells you to be ashamed, it's a really good idea to figure out why they're pointing that finger. Right. How do you think, how important do you think the link between authors and authors nowadays, and authors and fans nowadays, that they're so kind of easy with like internet and you can just connect really well with Twitter, Tumblr, and everything? Yeah, I think it's the coolest. Uh, I mean, like, I, I got into writing because I realized that at a young age that what I loved most about writing was getting to share it with, with readers. Um, so getting to talk to fans and see what characters they love, um, seeing them get invested in the series, I mean, it makes a lot of the hard work worth it um, and just I don't know it's like surreal still I still feel like sometimes it feels like none yeah. of it happened and that the fact yeah. that people care about the characters and love them just blows my mind yeah I think it's always a surprise when somebody actually says I loved your book and I don't know why it's still a surprise but yeah it's still um uh, it, it's always sort of a lovely feeling and I always say it's kind of you know it's fandom give it and take it away that um you know that passion can be uh, a wonderful thing, and it can be a scary thing too. Like all, you know, if, if people are not happy with the choice you made, they're gonna let you know. Um, so uh, there's, I think you're always walking the line between public and private when you're working as an author. But um, I, I really like it. I really, I, and I love seeing the art and the edits mm -hmm. and the mixes, and um, you know, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's a sort of a culture that didn't exist. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, God, like, if I had had that when I was a kid, like, it would have been the coolest thing to be able to tweet at my favorite authors and interact. Yeah, I yeah. wonder yeah. if I like, would have. Like, I always wonder if I would, or if I would have just been, like, lurking, watching their Twitter feed. <laughs> because, I, like, I still get a kick out of Anne Rice tweeting. I'll be like, oh, yeah. look. I mean, it's her assistant or whatever, but yeah. I still, you know. Um, I always wonder if I would have been, I wonder. Mm -hmm. You would have been a vocal 
I was very antisocial. Really? I don't know if the inter- yes. I don't know if the internet would have made me any more social. <laughs> I would have been like, I would have had this very angry blog somewhere. And like, like, I have no idea. <laughs> Alright, I'm just imagining like Teen Lee. Teen Lee listened to a lot of The Cure and wore a lot of black. Teen Lee is much like adult lady, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, so was it always fun to you? Yeah, fantasy, sci fi. You know, that I grew up with like, st- like Star Wars. Lord yeah. of the Rings, all that last unicorn. I watched the last unicorn on VHS, like <laughs> on a loop, pretty much from my childhood. Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz. I think you know, I hated the Wizard of Oz. What? Yeah, I really did, and I still do. Oh and there's my something God. wrong with me. I know. It's like my heart <laughs> is two sizes too small or something, but um, <laughs> I don't know. But for me, it was um, Dune and Labyrinth and Labyrinth. Legend. Like I, those were, yeah. yeah, those were the touchstones for me. But those are Labyrinth and Legend are like. They're it's still actually, good. Uh, they're, still, they're still good. <laughs> my, they're my, the lens of my experience. They're yeah, still. Yeah. I mean, they're, it's actually pretty hard to sit through most of Labyrinth. Like, the scenes no! that don't involve oh David Bowie are almost. No, she's so funny, though. And she's like, come on. Like, literally, oh my God. God. <laughs> they're so good. They're so good. The, bo- the, intro, the, the entire scene that's built around fart humor. Yeah. Like, the bog of <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, I must be just a perpetual. Old, I find that really fun. <laughs> they're like dying because of that. It's amazing. But I think it's awesome that it's a movie also that's about a girl who gets to like save the day and like you know do all this stuff. That it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. But it's also the funny thing is like the subtext of Labyrinth. Like yeah, going to go off on thing. But it's like well, no, because it's like everybody who watches that movie is like I I saw a midnight showing of it at Cine Family, and you know there's have you ever seen Labyrinth? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so as we talk about this, yeah. so you know there's the scene where she's like. And everybody in the theater was like, boo! <laughs> they were just what? like, you, if David Bowie invites you to a party with like people in crazy masks, like you go. You're not like, oh, I'm gonna save my baby brother. You stay and you hang out and you let him become a goblin. Like, I think there's a whole, like there's this whole part of a labyrinth that's all about like, um, like Sarah and Jared's shipping. It's all over the internet, you know, and, uh, but it's not really in the movie. Like no. he never actually says like, I was never in the that, queen. No. Um, but it's like, I think it's like a really good argument for YA, that whole movie. Because that movie is like, we're middle grade, and I'm like, nah, you should be YA. That movie's definitely YA. His tights make it YA. <laughs> <laughs> his tights make it something else entirely. His tights make it like, I don't know who should be watching that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, are you also like read a pin? Or are you more of a sympathetic and enjoy that they feel such strong emotions about your books? I mean, I don't like that one. I don't like anyone being in like pain <laughs> over stuff, but I find it like really cool when readers are genuinely moved to tears over yeah. stuff. But like, I don't like get off on readers <laughs> being. Um, I feel like you know those scenes are the ones that are often some of the hardest to write, and mm-hmm. um, that I tend to get emotional about. So it's sort of. Um, gratifying <laughs> that that other people have that experience you know if they didn't then we would have sort of missed the we would have we didn't get it right yeah yeah okay so some quick funny questions uh-oh. Quick uh-oh. uh-oh okay so hardbacks or paperbacks hardbacks paperbacks do you bend the spine break it ah my book was trashed but i love that that's why i like well paperback I let's go i am very <laughs> mighty you dog ear as well? <laughs> yes. Dog ear, yes. Yes. Oh. Which hog will have? Gryffindor, Slytherin. 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 <laughs> Slytherin. I decided. Slytherin. Slytherin. Good or evil? Um, what gray. is good? What is <laughs> evil? In, in between. Okay. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Dogs. Current TV obsession? Horse and Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> Outlander. Yeah. I just thought the question was just in there for that. Um, do you judge a book by its cover? Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. Okay, and would you rather be a Jedi, a Hobbit, a wizard, or a Disney princess? Jedi. Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> and what fictional world would you want to live in? Um, world of J.K. Rowling or uh-huh. um, World of Diana Wynne Jones. Mm-hmm. Like from House of I was thinking, I was thinking like, like, like not Crestomancy or like whatever, but like, yeah. 
Uh, I was thinking like a Miyazaki film, like Howl's Moving yeah. Castle, like where everything's beautiful and shiny and everything is crunchy. Mm -hmm. so I know, but then like you find a way to save the day and get to the hot chocolate. Like the movie with the gestures. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any advice for just why you readers, whether they be kind of wanting to be inspiring writers or they're just kind of just want to do something with their lives, they're just kind of reading why you. Um, <laughs> don't let anyone shame you for what you read or what you love in general. Plenty of people are going to tell you not to like X, Y, Z things. And if they've got a penny on that, screw them. Yeah. Do what you love and screw the rest. Um, I guess I would just say there's no expiration date on your talent. I know. It doesn't, if you don't do it. <laughs> don't cry. Yes, cry. Um, uh, you know, I think there's sometimes an idea that if you don't do something by this date or by this time, or that every decision you make is going to be kind of the end of the road, and it's not like that. Life's not like that, you know. As long as we have a story to tell, the world will be here. Okay. <laughs> so nice. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It was really.